All right. Welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. I'd like to welcome everybody here tonight to our college festivities on Zoom. Uh, the College of Complexes consists of the following format. First, we'll let our, our speakers speak for up to about an hour. Then we'll have our question and answer period. After and that's and during that period, we ask to ask questions of the of the speaker, and then after that, we'll have our infamous rebuttal period, where you can speak up to about five minutes. We generally go till about nine o'clock at night, and afterwards, you know, I'll keep the Zoom call open if we want to discuss things further. Um, with that, I'll start with the announcements period and open it to anybody who's got particular announcements. I know that oh, Charlie always does. So, Charlie, if you want to take it away, go ahead. All right. Welcome everyone to meeting number 3,641 of the College of Complexes, the playground for people who think. First of all, as always, we have a Google email group and a meetup group as well, functions in the same way. And I highly recommend that you subscribe to either one or both of those in order to get updates regarding uh, the coming up, coming programs. Uh, okay, although I am not a capitalist, I will give an advertisement for our upcoming programs. We've got quite a schedule here, folks. On November the 13th, Pache Bene, 30, 30 years they've been at it, uh, peacekeeping, pacifist, Taking to bring it in the warfare. And they have something called nonviolent service or nonviolent service campaign. So they're explaining that to us. They're excited about coming. On November the 20th, uh, this was in the news. The infrastructure measure was passed, uh, but the infrastructure, uh, national infrastructure people will be here. Uh, to go into detail about it, and uh, we'll see we'll see what their take is on what the uh, bipartisan result was of that uh, piece of legislation. On November the twenty seventh, Dan Lee was returning with another fascinating and well prepared program as always on racism, and she's saying our our concepts of racism are out of date. So that's uh, on the 27th. On December 4th, the topic will be ecological issues. The chief officer, director of the Illinois Environmental Council. These are the big shots um, in the environmental community. Uh, we'll be here talking about Illinois issues uh, regarding uh, uh, the ecology of the state of Illinois. They put together a uh, legislative uh, assessment, which involves an awful lot of work. On December the 11th, uh, the Center for Pluralism will be telling us on how you can talk with difficult people. Yeah. I'm an expert on that. Yeah, we know you're difficult. Oh, I'm I'm the easiest guy in town. <laughs> really? I'm Mr. Easy. <laughs> hey, Al, he's got a method uh, to how to talk with difficult people, like your boss, maybe, or something like that. On December the 18th, Reverend Charlier will be returning. He's setting up, and they just started meeting. He's got a Church of the Revolution. Uh, so... And he says it's intersectional eco-socialist, religious communism, all in one. He's got, that sounds like a good church to me. <laughs> got to have one. Okay, um, we skip over to January 8th and an organization I've been affiliated with for a number of years is America Walks. For those of us, uh, who want to live in uh, green communities, um, an eco village uh, where you're not dependent upon vehicles uh, for all, all, all your needs. 
uh, this is a good organization to, to talk to for low carbon lifestyle people like me. Um, okay, uh, and our next program then after that is on January uh, 22nd. Uh, this is going to be a good one, I think. Um, the Alliance for a Just Society. I think all of us are for justice, right? And for residency in a just society. So that will be the topic there. Um, and they're even focusing on transit issues. They have a national campaign for transit justice. Um, okay, uh, one little announcement on, on my own. Uh, for those of you involved in or concerned with public transit in Chicago, in particular, the CTA on Thursday at six o'clock will be the annual budget hearing okay. of the uh, Chicago Transit Authority of what their plans are for the coming year. Uh, you'll be given three to five minutes to make your comments regarding public transit within the city. So contact me or go to Citizens Taking Action for additional information. Okay, Tim, take it away. All right, I just also wanna let you know that we do have a Dallas campus on board. And with the, with the uh, Dallas campus, they do have some speakers coming in soon. Um, they meet on Thursdays. Um, and I'll just pull it up here real quick. Bear with me for a second. Uh, it's at the Texas campus and uh, we're gonna pull that up real quick just to show you what we do have with our Dallas people coming in. Um, he uh, has a meeting coming up on uh, Thursday. Really no scheduled speakers, but he'll, I'm sure if some of you guys wanna get in there and talk, he'll be ready to go. Um, his next meeting I think is gonna be on Thursday, November 11th. And Tom Barry and, and these guys, if you like what you hear at the college, sometimes joining them might be a good thing. He's had some speakers uh, come in and he's looking for people on the November 11th. Um, with that, uh, anybody else have an announcement that they'd like to bring out to the uh, jet for the general interest of our college body tonight? Y yes, I was just putting it in the chat. Um, uh, that the National Defense Authorization Act, in other words, the war budget, yeah. is now in the Senate. So it's time for us to contact our senators, Durbin and Duckworth, and say, cut that budget and fund social services instead. We all need universal health care. We need reparations. We need uh, infrastructure. Hey, they passed in the House today. <laughs> Yeah, well, the infrastructure was a good thing passing. I don't know about reparations. That's that's kind of crazy. Get it's not program. crazy when you consider redlining and what it has done to Chicago. Yeah, but, you know, like I said, it's a matter now of what's part of our historical past. I fully admit it. But, you know, it's also reverse discrimination when we start the same. Eh, never mind. I don't no, it isn't. I don't want to get, get, get rid of that reverse discrimination bit. <laughs> Well, you know, when, what, uh, Janice, never mind. We could get into this for, for hours. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> and Bob, Bob Matter, I'm sure, would back me up with a lot of the woke culture that we're starting to see. Oh, I need help. Please help me. <laughs> with all the woke culture. Yeah, I just read a book today on how woke culture has been being uh, used by the American corporations. It's another scam for more money. Never mind. You just read a book. <laughs> you got to do that again next year. Charlie, I've been doing a lot of, of, as you obviously know, I've got one out right now that I'm actually reading. It's called Travels with George. And it's about his uh, his um, book called uh, How He, how he tri never mind. I, I'm sorry, let's get off the announcements thing. I'll talk more about it in the after party. Marcia, if you're ready to go with your presentation, um, I'd like to hear it, so please, uh, the floor is yours, and my apologies if we got a little diverted here. So please uh, feel free to let us know your campaign and why you're running and whatever, and be prepared to take questions. So I am Marsha Williams. I am a mother of three. 
Um, I currently work at a trade school. We help people get their uh, class A CDL so they can drive a semi truck. And um, over the last uh, three years that I've been doing this, I've helped over 600 people um, get job training and into a better living situation. Um, I, uh, let's see, um, I decided to run for Congress just because a series of events that had happened over the last uh, year or this last election mm -hmm. cycle had made me decide that uh, Congress and is not, no longer representing the people in that more regular everyday people need to be in Congress. Um, it was kind of like a lead up point. Um, it really kind of started with uh, the death of George Floyd and how um, their, um, his death was highly politicized on both sides. And then it's then what really kind of infuriated me is after Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away and they were ramming through the nomination of Amy Coney Barrett before even Ruth Bader Ginsburg was even in the ground. They were already pushing her through six weeks before the election. And then January 6th happened and I said, I can't believe that the, that the, that we have gotten to this point where our own citizens um, had to storm the Capitol and completely vandalize it and try to hurt our own, you know, our way that we do our voting, our, 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 our voting process works. They wanted to kind of end that. Um, and then um, I kind of sat for a couple of months and I really was just discussing it with my family, talking about, you know, logistics and things like that. And then we made a decision um, to announce in April. Um, I do work full time and I do work full time and I run my campaign. So I kind of working from sunup to sundown uh, some days. Um, just a little bit of my family history. Um, I grew up in Juliet. I then my was my teenage years, we moved to Sherwood and I ended up being a graduate of Minica Community High School. Um, my both my parents and um, I were always active in the community. Uh, my mother um, and father were both union members. Um, my mother was a CNA and my father was a maintenance man, which was a glorified name for a janitor. But we lived really well for them to be in such a kind of a, um, you know, from being a CNA and a janitor. We actually lived in a modest sized home. My parents always had newer cars. I've always never went without. Um, that was mainly because they had that union support. Um, I have three kids. Hmm? I have. I have three kids, um, but one is deceased. I have, um, I had a, I had a pregnancy fail when I was uh, nine months pregnant. I was so far along in my pregnancy that my scheduled C-section was 12 days later. Wow. And um, so I still always say that I have three children because my son is always still with me. Um, my two living children is uh, my daughter, Amelia. She's six, she just turned 16 on October 28th. So she's excited to kind of drive and kind of fly out of the nest a little bit. Um, I'm a little scared because I, my insurance is going to go up <laughs> and she's going to, you know, want to be around town and all that. And then I have a three-year-old son. His name is Lincoln. And he's your typical toddler asking a lot of questions, always likes to talk. He's very rambunctious. Um, and I've been in a committed relationship um, for about, about five years. So um, I'm really excited that the infrastructure plan has finally passed because we live um, where I live. I live right off of Interstate 55 in uh, the I-80 corridor there. I live in a little subdivision around there. Um, and that is just a nightmare. They actually call it the death trap. <laughs> they have a Facebook group called the IEDI 55 death trap. Um, and we have a bridge that goes over the Des Plaines River on I-80 that's rated six out of a hundred. This bridge needs to be completely replaced. We have a smaller bridge that's off a side road called the Brandon Street Road Bridge. And the Brandon Street Road Bridge, this one is, um, it's never, it never works. It's so old that when it breaks, they have to actually have a custom made part. So this bridge is shut down for six to eight months and then it's back up again for two or three months and it's back down again. Um, so um, we're happy with that infrastructure plan. 
um, because now we can have that funding to be able to expand I-80. We want to expand it from two lanes to three lanes and then replace that bridge and hopefully invest in a lot of more greener energy um, that are that would impact uh, not only the state of Illinois, but in everybody in the entire country as well. That's okay. And keep going. What else? What, I'm keep sorry. going. Yeah, I mean, okay. this is your, this is where you you prepare your. This is this is the formal part where you introduce yourself, you give your okay. stance and a candidacy and all that, mm -hmm. and right. then we'll get into our question period. Okay. So my main focus is um, from when my campaign is is based on my personal experience is to offer and expand a, a lot more services to offer either low income um low, either very very affordable or free trade school. Right now, uh, there is 700,000 jobs for CDL that's out there. Um, it, this is a really easy job to do. I, I had a lot of students who didn't know the difference between their left or the right, and they ended up passing and now they're making six figures a year uh, driving a semi truck. Uh, a lot of our supply and demand issues that are, we're having a lot, or the supply issues that we're having right now, is um, is the district. It's um, it's due to the truck driver shortage. So all those boats that are on the on the ports, not just in in California, but all over the country, is because they don't have enough drivers moving that product off those boats um, into um, you know onto the shelves. Um, so, but my my experience is that a lot of people can't afford it. Our our trade school. Our CL school costs four thousand dollars, and a lot of people don't have the money for that. But there is a current program out there that's called WIOA, and WIOA is short for Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act. It's something that is countrywide and get a certain amount of federal funds to offer training for low income or unemployed individuals, and this is a part of your like unemployment benefits too. Um, but the income qualifications, it's like $20,000 a year or less. So if somebody's making maybe $12, $13 an hour and they're working full time, they cannot qualify for the WIOA program because they make technically too much. So the goal is to move up those income guidelines and actually offer more funding. So people that are, are actually are working, but they're working poor can be able to get a grant pay for free you know so they can get their school paid for and they actually can get in a better paying career uh, and this is not just for cdl drivers this is for heating and air electrician plumber you know you whatever any kind of trade you can think of usually is covered under that weoa uh, grant um, the next thing is to be able to offer federal protection underneath mothers like myself who've had um, loss of pregnancies. So what is going on in our country, even though we're, you know, we, we see many states are making these huge anti-choice um, bills and having them passed. Um, the goal is to make sure that if a woman who has a miscarriage or a stillbirth is not denied medical treatments because this is where the gray area is. <laughs> um, the medical de definition of an abortion is a termination of a pregnancy when a live birth is not present. When a woman has a miscarriage or a stillbirth, it's called a spontaneous abortion. When my son died, I chose that day to have a C-section and give birth to my son. My hospital was pushing me to carry my son an additional two weeks until I went to natural labor. And at the time I thought, well, why, why wait two weeks? There's nothing that's gonna happen, you know, what's gonna happen is I'm gonna get sick um, and, and put my life at risk um, for the outcome to be the same. So I gave an option to have, you know, give birth to him that day. But my medical records, it shows a late term, it shows an abortion. Why? Because I was pregnant and I needed to terminate my pregnancy. I needed to end my pregnancy and I needed to remove my child from my body, AKA abort him and to have him removed. So what happens say, for example, in Georgia, 
Georgia has the highest maternal mortality rate in our country because these women who have pregnancies that have failed or have gone wrong are being denied medical treatment because they have anti-choice laws. Um, Texas, now they have their um, abortion ban. Actually, 10% of maternal mortality comes out of the state of Texas. Um, their maternal mortality is estimated to rise between 18 and 36%. So I give it a, like a year, they're, they're gonna beat Georgia. And Georgia right now has over, it has about 100 per 100,000 births. 100 of, those, 100 of those women die. Versus Illinois has seven out of 100,000 deaths. Um, seven women out of 100,000 deaths. Um, ended up passing. So being a hundred, that's huge. That's a, that's a large amount. Um, and a lot of times, you know, what, what, what politicians don't think of is that when a woman's pregnant, nothing's going to happen, you know, because you know, <laughs> the, 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 there's a miracle or there's some type of force field around the woman and, and she's not going to have any health issues, um, which is not the case. Many women do have health issues. Um, there was a case that was even in Texas that I just saw like on TikTok where um, a woman who had preeclampsia needed to give birth to her child two weeks early to save, you know, for medical reasons. And she was denied and both of them died. Uh, we had another woman that was in Oklahoma who had a miscarriage at 22 weeks and she end, ended up surviving, but she ended up getting arrested for homicide. Um, so my main focus is, is to bring light that the fact that pregnancies do fail for a variety of medical reasons that sometimes there's no fault of the mother and that those women need to be able to be protected and receive the medical treatment that they need. Because before Road versus Wade, maternal mortality was high in our country overall. But once we were, you know, once they had the decision for Road versus Wade, the maternal mortality plummeted. It just, you, if you see the, the charts, I should have brought it, it was like really high and then it just crashed. Like just because now women were able to get actual basic medical treatment. Um, so that's my, my, my main focus. And that's because it's very, very personal to me because I could have been one of those women that may, may have been buried next to my child and not have been able to get pregnant again and have another child. Um, and then, you know, my personal experience, um, with, with trade schools, you know, with trade schools, it, they're lacking because there was such a huge push and there's still continuing a huge push for students to go to college. I, I'm 40 years old. I graduated high school in 1999. And I remember back then they were talking, they were bragging to the parents, all oh, this school they have, you know, 80% of the students go to college and we're and push, pushing them to go to college and pushing them to go to college. But my friends who went to trade, trade schools are, are doing far better financially than, than my myself and father, fellow um, classmates did that went to college just because it was such a low investment, but a high, you know, the, the, the wages in those areas were a lot higher. Um, so we need to focus a lot on the trades just because we've been lacking on that. Um, and then we've been really focusing heavily on green energy um, in, uh, in our district. Uh, we, um, we have three nuclear power plants in, uh, that's uh, kind of around in our area. It has a no negative uh, carbon output. And then they actually put in Will, I live in Will County. Um, they actually put in a, um, they put in a, a solar farm and it costs, and this county's big, um, they cost the taxpayer 0. 0.004 cents. So you take a penny and you cut it in a quarter, you know, in quarters, and you take one quarter out of it, that's how much it costs to do that, um, which 
provided a lot of energy um, for the people in, in our county. As what you can was see, the name of the solar farm? farm? The name of it? Mommy, what? Yeah. I, I, mommy's on the phone, buddy. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, the name of it, I don't know the name of it. You said a solar farm in Will County? Yes. No! <laughs> yeah. There are several solar farms in yeah. Will County. Oh, okay. It's new. Yeah. Anyway, it, it's yeah. just, it's just, it's just, um, I was just curious because I was wanting to look it up on my other computer. Okay. Anyway, keep, keep going. Um, but the good thing is that when we invest in um, a lot more greener energy, especially with the Green New Deal, um, that we'll be able to uh, invest in the greener energy that has uh, no carbon output and that we can be able to, um, you know, invest in that. Uh, I think I did the math. The Green New Deal is going to cost an average taxpayer $46 a year over a period of 10 years. And you're going to see an immediate decline in your utilities. So basically you're gonna have that return on your investment. Uh, so where we can be able to offer more greener energy um, to um, you know, our, our, you know, all of our citizens in the country. Um, is, do you wanna keep going or do you wanna start taking questions? I can start taking questions. Okay. Um, it's I have a question. Go ahead, Janice. We'd um, like to see if you could, you know. Okay. I was eating dinner and I didn't want to do that in front of you. No. Um, um, let's see. Let me start video. By the way, let's thank our speaker. Real okay. Quick. Yeah, thank you, Marsha. Thank you. Um, Marsha, what district are you going to run in? What district am I going to run in? Right. So, um, Right now, we uh, are exploring the open seat in District 17. Um, that is um, that was Sherry Busto's seat that she is retiring from. Oh. Um, we are um, exploring that because with the way the lines are drawn, District 16, the one that Adam Kingsley just drawn from, is very ruby red. It's a um, about I think they said a, a, a Republican plus 23 points, so pretty much a Democrat running in there you know, like it would be, you know, per person that would do that would just do it for, I think, fun, that for the <laughs> win. So, um, um, but um, good thing is that I do a lot of work in that area where the, the trucking company that I work for actually has um, three branches in the area. They have one in the Quad Cities, one in Rockford, and one in Peoria. So I'm already familiar with the district there and, you know, the, for the needs of the people. So we have been um, exploring the, that um, that that um, open seat as well, um, just because of the you know the point of um, um, District 16 at this point. But then again, those lines are final. Uh, the governor can look at the, these lines and say, "Well, this is not what I envisioned," and and tell them to do redo it. So, um, so we will wait to see. He has 14 days. He had 14 days from October 29th. Or 28th, October 28th. Um, so, I mean, the time is ticking. We should find out this week if he signs it. Okay, I'm going to write to um, my state legislators or, or to the governor mm -hmm. and say no to this, these map, this uh, third map that they came mm -hmm. up with. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a little, uh, it was not what I expected. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I mean, I envision something a little bit different. So, thank you. You're welcome. Well, okay, go ahead. Who's got the next question? Charlie. Yes. You described the situation there. Uh, you apparently have traffic congestion mm -hmm. in the district. Mm -hmm. And I've been dealing in transportation for a number of years and kind of know a little bit about congestion. Mm -hmm. But do you think adding another lane is going to eliminate the transportation problem? 
you know, it's definitely going to help. Um, but that the bridge that goes over I-80, it's, it's in really bad shape. Um, usually any structural engineer will let you know that bridges usually last between 50 and 60 years. And this bridge was erected in the 60s. So we're been, it's, it's well past its prime. Um, that bridge that does go, it's on I-80 that goes over the Des Plaines River in Joliet, that it needs to be completely replaced. That it's 100% certain that it needs to just be, we need to need a brand new one. And um, with what's been going on, they've been building a lot of warehouses that are in that I-80, I-55 corridor that we have a lot more traffic than what was accommodated. So like the third lane, like, is it going to make the traffic problems go away? Probably not, but it will make it a little bit better. Maybe. <laughs> I have another question. Go ahead. I mean, we're, we're waiting for others to come on in. If nobody else pipes up, go ahead, Janice. Well, relative to uh, Charles' question, that's a good question. Um, uh, our, we need more public transportation. Mm -hmm. That's what we need. Uh, because, yes, uh, there's too much traffic. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Well, the good thing is that the Green New, Green New Deal will actually, and I think the infrastructure plan did it include the part of this. I didn't fully read all of it yet. Um, but it, it's going to offer high-speed uh, rail, and that's going to be really, really beneficial because now that they're going to have stops in, like, these rural areas Mm -hmm. um they for these you know maybe smaller towns so then say somebody wants to that are maybe is in you know a rural area in the western part of illinois and they want to take a train up to chicago they can just hop mm -hmm. right in and drive and then ride up or they can go to new york california or anything like that and then, then that would be uh, like i'd like to be able to take the train to princeton illinois yes Hopefully that would be a reality for you. Is to take it to or the red line, I would like it to extend to the border of southern border of Chicago. Yes. Familiar with red line. Get out to McHenry County, transport public transit's almost non-existent. Mm -hmm. You're better off with a vehicle. And I have very mm -hmm very good with road construction charlie thinks i'm nuts but uh mm -hmm. you know but you can read books and magazines on trains you can't do that while you're yeah. driving huh. yeah. yeah if i try to even take a public transit to franklin park it'd take me an extra hour and a half <laughs> yeah but just think you could get through the whole book uh yeah right <laughs> i still have to drive to elgin from algonquin that could take about four, 35 minutes alone and by the time i i just had an extra 15 i go straight to work that's the advantage of a car. Yeah, well, the dis there's disadvantages too, <laughs> Tim. Yeah. Plus $10,000 a year up front minimum. Yeah, well, that's it's like have I said, an automobile. It's, a, it's $20 round trip every day by the train alone. That couldn't afford $4,000 in tuition. And you say, oh, everybody just go out and buy a car. They can't afford to get to go to school. To upgrade their skills, but maybe it's because they have to pay for a damn car. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. well, you're right. You don't need a car, Charlie. We understand mm -hmm. that. That's a city, more density, more urban, urban sprawl. And uh, be, besides, uh, you wouldn't even have a place to park a car where you live at. But I understand that that's the one part of it. Right, let me ask the speaker. So it was my understanding my knowledge of uh, Illinois Amtrak, that's the one part of the state of Illinois where there is no Amtrak service. What's that? That Western section. Yeah, but that's also all very lightly populated out in that Western section, isn't there? You know. Well, it, it covers the rest of Illinois. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it'd be nice to have those more little... densely populated than the other sections who mm -hmm. presently have Amtrak. Mm -hmm. And there, is, it would be nice to have the more of the trains, like you know, like Princeton, Dixon, you know, the little more small rural towns. You know, they they used to have that back in the day, where they 
where people were able to take the, the train and then, you know, and go to, to a, a bigger city, you know, or just travel really anywhere. We, before we, when we were, before we were relying on cars, we used trains. We used um, another source of, to be able to be mobile. And, you know, we can kind of get a little bit back to, you know, what our, um, to our, I guess, roots and just kind of go, kind of go back to that style um, where we can put a little less, um, a little less uh, vehicles on the road and, and things like that. Um, okay, I got a question. Your concerns were there about people affording to go to trade school. Mm -hmm. what about, do you have anything about people who want to go to college and can't afford it? Yeah, there's a lot I of people. Understand that... they can't pay for it even if they do go. Isn't that well, the I... going to Bernie? Well, I have over a hundred thousand dollars in student loan debt, so I'm one of those people that would have loved to would have paid a little bit more in taxes and then not have to worry about student loan debt. The reason we saw this huge housing boost over the, over the last, you know, maybe about six or seven months is because when they stopped their, um, the student loan payments for a while, people that want, were renting who wanted to buy a house but couldn't because of their student loans were able to. Why? Because when people try to apply for like say FHA or a conventional loan, they have to calculate their debt to income ratio. And at that point when the student loan payment stopped, their debt to income ratio was no longer a factor into their approval process for their mortgages. So a lot of people, um, you know, who could afford my, they were, people went crazy because they're like, now we can buy a house. We don't have to worry about our student loans buggling us down. Um, and a lot of people that were, say, renting were now buying. And a lot of, it was a, it's definitely a seller's market. market. But we purchased a home and that was included, that that's what our mortgage loan officer told us is that the, debt, the student loan debt was not calculated into the debt to income ratio because the payment stopped. And a lot of other friends who had the similar situation went through and these are doctors and lawyers who are able to afford a mortgage but they have such high student loan debt they couldn't even afford they couldn't qualify for it because the, to that debt to income ratio um, many states or many countries around the world you know they 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 tax the rich so then people can be able to go to college and be able to go to trade school and do it for free so according to the Democratic Socialists, this student debt money is owed to the United States government. And if I'm if they're correct, the government could just say, that's okay, it's paid for. Is that accurate? I have no idea. I know when they have if they have the money to bail out a bunch of billionaires during the, the crash in 2008 for them to be able to pay their executives a bunch of um, bonuses <laughs> um, so they can buy another summer home. We have money to be able to bail out our regular American people. Aren't they job creators? 90% of the job creators are actually small business owners. And if small business owners, they're the small business owners. I have a kind of a wonky question, I guess. Uh, okay. Yeah, um, recently um, the um, uh, Progressive uh, Caucus in the United States um, House of Representatives um, um, switched a little bit of their tactics. Um, they originally had uh, said that they would not um, sign or would not vote for the um, uh, so-called hard infrastructure package until the uh, larger bill that had um, 
uh, mainly social and, e and um, ecological um, uh, programs in it, uh, plus a hodgepodge of whole other things. Um, they would not vote until that large um, bill, uh, the bill, so-called Build Back Better bill, uh, was able to be voted on, on at the same time, but they changed their tactics just um, a few days ago. Um, and uh, a few of the uh, progressive uh, co uh, Congress members um, did not uh, vote for the um, uh, hard infrastructure bill, um, but uh, Republicans um, uh, who evidently there were projects in their district or for, or for reasons that they actually just thought it was good for the country, who knows, maybe there are a handful of those. Um, they went along with it so that Pelosi was able to get it through, but it was a possible repudiation of that original plan, which supposedly there was a, um, you, you could have said an obligation um, to, um, to hold firm um, uh, on the part of the Progressive Caucus. Do you think that that was, that tactical change was a good one? If you were in Congress, would you have um, gone with what we might might call it a pragmatic view that um, uh, making sure that it was, it was okay to not have a total uh, firm uh, vote, uh, successful vote uh, on both bills at the same time, that that's okay. So there was a, a ton of those bills that came up. Was it the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act bill or was it the Build Back Better one? Well, the, the Build Back Better bill, um, uh, which Biden and most of them have been calling it lately. Uh, they used to call it the Human Infrastructure <laughs> Bill, <laughs> but um, people had different names for it. I don't know what the official name is myself, um, but it now is is scored as supposedly being $1.75 trillion um, expenditure, but is supposed to be paid for in full. I was, I was considering, you know, calling into radio programs and saying, well, why, why don't they call it the paid for bill? But <laughs> I stopped myself from doing it because it may not be completely paid for when the congressional, um, uh, whatever that um, uh, bureau that uh, scores these bills may come back and say, in fact, they've been hinting they'll come back and say it's not paid for completely. But that's all a matter of conjecture, of course, because we all know, like, like with, with budgets, they're only estimates. Um, but uh, the, the, the question is, would you have considered that it was like a moral or a, or a definite agreement that you wouldn't break um, the, uh, uh, the pledge, as it were, that the, the Progressive Caucus all supposedly took a pledge that they would not vote for the hard infrastructure, which is about equal to $1 trillion for roads and bridges, what you were talking about, for for example, the bridge over um, the river at I-80. Uh, I um, that hard bill, they voted for it mostly except for six, including AOC and uh, a few other members. But members, for example, like uh, Mark Pocan did vote for it. They went along with the possibility that the linkage was not 100% between the two bills. Would you have gone with the Mark Pocan um, strategy or would you have stuck with the AOC strategy that uh, you would not allow the linkage uh, between those two bills to be broken? Um, I would have to look at both of the bills first to be able to make my decision. But when I represent, I'm, I'm representing the people and if I see that that my constituents have a need and that my district has a need, I'm going to vote all the time in the need of what my district is and what the, the needs of the people are. Um, what I think one of the things is that is what is broken in Congress is that everybody kind of votes along with, you know, right? But they're not say, okay, well, we have a certain need um, and, you know, let's vote for that need. So there was at least three of those bills that have come up. So I would have to just like look in depth on that before I would make my decision. But at this point, based on what you said and from what I've been reading thus far, I probably would take the AOC position. Well, if you were... If you thought that it was absolutely essential that you get the hard infrastructure, 
Mm -hmm. um, as you seem to be saying, you would vote for the best interests of your constituents. Mm -hmm. I would have thought you would have gone with the Mark Pocan. <laughs> <laughs> but there's no there's no absolute answer. This is a it's a it's a terrible dilemma. I think that the House Democrats have been put in uh, because oh. of the small majority. Uh, so I just was I just was throwing that out as a complicated question for you. Yeah. Well, <laughs> this infrastructure plan is a long time coming. Um, I read or listened to the audio book of um, was it a uh, former speaker John what's his last name John Bay Bayer Bay Bayer what's his name Bayer yeah. yeah that's him excuse me. <coughs> Yeah, it looks like Boner, but he pronounces it Boehner. Boehner, yes. Um, he was talking in his book that they were trying to push that infrastructure plan when Obama was still in office back in 2011, 2012. So now we're here 10 years later, and we're still we're now getting this infrastructure plan through. So at this point, you know, it's way long overdue. And if we keep on going back and forth, you know, it's just not going to, no one's going to, it's not going to help anybody. And we need to start just moving forward. And then we can probably do, you know, a little bit smaller impacts of the build that, that may have been left out and try to see if we can get that through. But <laughs> sorry about that. I hope you don't have COVID. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> Uh, so, um, <laughs> it was tested. So unfortunately, so have, have you been, have you been immunized? Um, yes, I have been vaccinated. And, I, and not inoculated like, um, that, uh, football player, uh, <laughs> hardly can name. I think we, we should, maybe we should X, X, um, what, what do you expel him from the NFL and, um, uh, Rogers, X that's his name. <laughs> We we should expel them from the NFL and um, and uh, maybe. <laughs> well, I uh, you, you you've had you've had the vaccine. I I take. Yes, I have the okay, vaccine. Great. I'm waiting to get my booster. So, uh, but uh, I had to take that test a lot of times, and I just no, I hate that test. It's like we have we have a lot of people so here on the, at the college that think it's better to take a horse warmer after you're sick. You know. Well, we <laughs> They're not here tonight, but uh, yeah, well, a couple of them are, I think. <laughs> They're giving you a lobotomy. It's what it feels like. I feel like I'm getting a lobotomy. So, <laughs> okay, well, it's better than a. It, is that better or worse than a bottle in front of you? A bottle. A, bo a bottle in front of you. A lobotomy. You said a lobotomy. Lobotomy. It's like, it like you were having a lobotomy. Yeah. It, it's a joke. It's a Lehrer um, a song. I'd rather have a bottle in front of me than in front of lobotomy. Yes, it's an old really joke from the 60s. Gotcha. I date myself. Depends on what's in the bottle. You're a, you're a young upper comer. I'm an old whippersnapper. Okay. Well, it depends <laughs> on what's in the bottle. An old whippersnapper. <laughs> <laughs> I got a question. Go ahead, Charlie. Yeah, Miss Williams. There are three nuclear reactors you indicated in proximity to the district. Yes. From what I understand, the state of Illinois had to spend a considerable amount of money because of the age of these reactors. Mm -hmm. Is it any concern to you that at any given moment, any one or all of these might explode and cause irreparable harm okay. to the people who live there? Yes. So. I actually live in very close proximity to one, so I would be one of those people. Um, so basically after a certain amount of time, the, that nuclear power plant needs to be upgraded and recommissioned. And once it gets recommissioned and it's deemed safe, um, then it can extend the life of these nuclear power plants. How do you make one safe? <laughs> what do you mean safe? Now, how do you make one safe? Charlie is such an anti-nuclear advocate. It's crazy. Yes. He thinks they all should okay. I, don't know. I don't know how you do that. 
<laughs> Marsha, they're trying to drag you into an argument. Uh, hey, Marsha, okay. what's happening is Charlie. Charlie, is long Charlie long wants to get you into the anti nuke argument. We we would, you do not want to go down this rabbit hole because you're looking at I a don't. guy here. You're I looking don't. at a guy here who's who. I'm a member of what we call the Thorium Energy Alliance out of Harvard, Illinois, who thinks that small modular reactors of the liquid fluoride type are the solution to climate change. And others are thinking I'm absolutely nuts. We've had whole sessions on this a numerous times here at the at the college. And Charlie is dead set against any form of nuclear power because this is a- Do you, do you think people should own their own private nuclear reactor as Tim advocates? I never said that, Charlie. I think a corporation could use one like a steel plant or something. It might be a little bit better than all the coal oh. burning. You could you could pepper the district with nuclear reactors. If, they, if they're small and modular and of the thorium type, I don't Welcome see why to not. Midland. Huh? Uh, Marsha, hey, you'd I have get, to do I, a lot of reading to, to get onto what they're talking about. Yeah, Marsha, okay. don't, don't Bill worry Gates, for it. one, has, has advocated the possibility of small uh, modular reactors that and okay. he's got a lot of good stuff, but I mean, the thing is, is that what I advocate is I, I like the, um, you know, so we're going to need solar, we're going to need wind, we're going to need uh, anything we can get, but nuclear is, I think, going to be a large component of our getting off of carbon-based fuels. Okay. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, we got to have it somewhere. Well, there's a video game that I play. It's the only one I play. It's called Fallout, mm -hmm. and basically, it's the most real for post-apocalyptic games this is the most realistic version of a post-apocalyptic world and i'll explain why so america and china were fighting over the last fossil fuels there was a huge war that was in alaska right it mm -hmm. seems pretty much legit like they the fossil fuels it's we're on we're on our last leg on it um Basically, America and China, they just jump, they launch a bunch of nukes on each other. They just nuke the crap out of each other. So there's a fall of the government. Pretty much everybody has to self-govern. There's pockets of like high nuclear areas, but um, there's enemies and things like, you know, like people like trying to like, you know, looters, like they're trying to like, loot, you know, steal all your stuff, you know, but since they were out of fossil fuels, they were heavily reliant on nuclear energy. And they had these little things that were probably the size of like a, like a, mon like a can of monster um, that were little tiny nuclear reactors. And you can stick them in your cars, you know, or you can stick them into like a, you can plug it in the side of your house. And they had little tiny nuclear reactors that was, it was the size of like a monster can. <laughs> it's in the game. They fueled the cars with it. They fueled the people's homes with it. Uh, interesting. Yeah. So interesting. it's cute. It's interesting that they're trying to, you know. Well, if we had cold fusion like Pons and Fleischmann said we were uh, cold have. fusion. <laughs> Back in, back wow. in the early nineties, I think that was that would be that would have solved all our problems. But of course, the uh, the corporate state uh, put a stop to that. They suppressed all the information, so. If you knew how to do it, you could build one in your garage, um, right? That's a conspiracy theory. But uh, mm -hmm. at any rate, um, yeah, um, you don't have to go on the record as being yeah. pro-nuclear or anti-nuclear. And I think it's um, in the old days um, when I was with the Citizens Party, we, we were thoroughly anti-nuclear except that I still had a little bit of an open mind at that time um, but um, um, I tend to I tend to think that um, um, these um, uh, all these technological uh, solutions um, are going to be so expensive that um, we're get, maybe going to have to have a revolution and take the money from the rich people it's, uh. it's been like so it's been hard to you know you look at uh, oh, here's the thing. Um, um, uh, as far as um, uh, Biden's attempt to um, to uh, tax the rich, uh, <laughs> you know, taking a taking a um, uh, a slogan from um, the um, 
uh, evening gown that AOC was wearing that time. Um, uh, it looks like we're we're down to where we're not making uh, enough revenue from the Build Back uh, Better bill because they gave up taxing carried interest. I understand, which is that you know loophole that um, um, that great patriot um, uh, Romney uh, <laughs> Mitt Romney <laughs> used to become wealthy. One of them, at least. Um, uh, the idle rich, um, um, you know, borrowing off their stock, you know, which when it was revealed by the New York Times, I said, gosh, I wondered if that's what they were doing, because I kept on constantly hearing about how these rich were avoiding taxes. Okay, so you borrow off your stock, and, um, and then you uh, get like a one or two percent interest loan or something, you know, from a bank. And of course, well, oh, you have all this Amazon stock. So, I mean, that's good. It, Amazon stock never goes down. Well, I, actually, it went down 100 points uh, <laughs> last week or the week before. Then it rallied back up again, uh, about 180 points. But for a while, it was going down. So, I mean, I guess the bank should have asked Jeff Bezos for their money back. But you, you borrow at one or two percent and you live off the money and you never actually realize your capital gains. So by the tax system, it's like you you didn't make any money. Oh, so uh, um, that's a that's a nice trick that uh, most of us uh, uh, can't um, can't exactly do. Um, um, so here we are. We've, we've got this bill. And um, it was supposed to be, again, I, I said it was supposed to be the paid for bill. And I almost thought they should have been calling it that. But uh, it may turn out that it, you know, they may turn out to be a few dollars short of what they said it was going to raise because of all this whittling down the, um, because remember, Biden was going to uh, raise the corporate tax rate back up, not totally to uh, pre-Trump taking office uh, levels, but, you know, maybe about half that. And they, they shut that down. Um, if I'm, if my memory is correct, it's been through so many iterations. What's your memory, Marsha, about what that is? The um, were they able to raise the corp? They're, they're trying this new uh, uh, mandatory minimum thing, which they're also pushing to the rest of the world, and trying to make arrangements so that there will not be as much of a race to the bottom as there has been, by at least having this 15% minimum corporate tax rate. Um, but um, I'll, I'll ask for corporations that make 50 billion or something there's so many i mean so you have a loophole if you can manage to show i guess that you only made 14.9 billion then this doesn't affect you i'm laughing because it's so complicated and it's hard to keep all these um percentages and figures in your in your head um and it turns around so much um, uh why can't we go back to um you know the 91 percent rate uh that we had <laughs> until um, way into into the Eisenhower years. Um, it's kind of funny. You watch an old Twilight Zone, <laughs> and they talk about the ninety one percent income tax rate, <laughs> and you say, "Wow, <laughs> gee, if we could just have maybe it be, you know, forty nine percent." You know. <laughs> anyway, um, it would it would pay for a lot of those things, and it, it would cancel out your student debt and. Um, Unfortunately, they left a lot of things um, out of the newer version of this uh, Build Back Better bill, one of which is, of course, you know, dental for seniors, and I'm a senior now, so that's my ox being gored, Yeah, <laughs> use a term. Well, I'm rambling on. I'm, I, I okay. think uh, that um, I, a question, I wanted to get it off of the damn nuclear thing. <laughs> uh, good. Marsha, what's your... Uh... Are you familiar with hydrogen power and the infrastructure with it at all? In the current, the hydrogen power in the current infrastructure plan? No, no. What I'm saying is, are you familiar with um, the usage of hydrogen for as, as a replacement for fossil fuels? No. Um, oh, okay. It's something you ought to consider because it, mm -hmm. it can be a replacement for natural gas and it can also be used as hydrogen fuel cells in cars and a lot of it can be produced by you know electric power and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, the only byproduct from burning hydrogen is water. Okay. Yeah, but you do need to have ec extra solar um, power generation. Yeah, solar power. Convert the electricity. 
or yeah, you, 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 have you can use hydroelectric or geothermal to make that electricity, but that's that's where you get that. Uh, that's where you get. The, you have to be able to um, uh, to create the hydrogen. Actually, I mean, well, you extract the hydrogen. Um, an excellent book by Jeremy Rifkin that was published in the '90s that talks about it. Yes. Well, the, one of the major problems is hydrogen. You know, leaks out um, of most materials that you try to use to contain it. So now, if we can solve that problem. I don't know. Has that problem been solved, Tom? Uh, Tim? Um, I, I of, don't know yet. I haven't done enough research in it. I'm just, uh, I'm just starting to get into it a little bit more myself. A, you know. Yeah, that's the problem. I mean, you know, any ordinary pipes, um, um, hydrogen, you can't store it for a long time or any container. I mean, it, it will leak um, out. Um, so the other, the other thing too is it has to be used fairly quickly after it's uh, after it's generated from electrolysis of water. They're coming up too with electric jet airplanes for short haul flights too that don't use fossil fuels. Yes, I've heard of that. I know there's prototypes. Okay. So let's um, let's let's get back to Marcia. Marcia, yeah. what are your thoughts on all this stuff? I'm sorry, Marcia. We keep diverting down to infamous rabbit holes here. Mm -hmm. We have questions. I believe it's a question period. It is, it is. Michael, Nicole, Ileana, Sharon, Doug. We haven't heard from the campaign manager. Nicole, you've got anything you'd like to add about? Yeah, Nicole, please show your face too so we can see it. I got a little dark in here, so I turned off my camera. <laughs> That's all right, Nicole. We can see you fine. Well, um, I suppose if you have any questions for me, I, I would love to answer them. I mean, you know, Marsha covered pretty much all the bases, you know, um, of well, what, uh, we're, what we're fighting for. <laughs> um, yeah, Nicole, what kind of a budget would you have um, for the campaign? Um, how do you mean? And that, that, well, we know, we know their estimates, um, but, um, you know, how much would you be able to spend? I mean, and how would you raise the money? Would it be, a, it would be a, a, an internet type of, um, you know, GoFundMe sort of thing, um, just raising funds off the internet? Um, yeah, so I mean, for the campaign, we, um, we're running a grassroots campaign, you know, we're not taking any corporate donations. Um, everything that we take in is from you know, actual real people, um, you know, and people are uh, capped at uh, donating $2,900 to a campaign per election. Um, so that means people can only give us up to $2,900. So a lot of our time is spent, um, you know, like we send out emails um, with updates about the campaign. We make phone calls to uh, voters and donors. Um, you know, there's people all over the United States who donate to political campaigns, uh, especially of like our more progressive nature. Um, and so a lot of early campaign work, which I'd say we're still in the early stage of campaigning, um, is, you know, reaching out to those sorts of people and um, talking to them about, you know, the issues that they care about. Um, you know, Marsh is very dedicated to um, making those calls and talking with, you know, uh, not just people in Illinois, but all over the U.S. Um, about what's impacting them. So she was actually making a lot of calls to Texas wow. after the abortion ban uh, because, you know, she knows that issue personally and um, was just kind of talking with people there because she wanted to understand how best to support them at that time. So once we have, um, you know, raised raised a good amount of money and, and we can really start hitting the ground running and we know where the uh, district lines are, which we're still waiting for J.B. Pritzker on. Um, you know, once he signs a map in, uh, we'll start knocking on doors and making calls to those voters specifically and making sure that we have as many people, you know, registered and turning out to vote as possible. I used to know a lady, um, she was running for Congress a few years ago, and they told me you almost have to have a full-time accountant to run the funding for these small campaigns. What do you have as far as full-time staff on the campaign, or do you have any yet? We do, yeah. So um, I, I am obviously full-time staff. Um, and then on top of that, we have, um, you know, some, some consultants. We have, you know, our fundraising team. Um, and um, right now, I'm trying to think of how many people we have on. Um, you know, we have, a, we have a really good group of people, a lot of very experienced campaign staff. Um, I myself, I've worked on um, a presidential campaign. I worked on Bernie Sanders' 2020 race. Um, I've worked on a handful of other, you know, congressional, Senate, and local level campaigns. 
Um, mm -hmm. On top of that, we have a former um, Bernie state director and advisor. Uh, we, you know, we have people who have political careers that are longer than the amount of time that I've been alive. Um, and I think that we have a really, really good team put together. And honestly, it's one of the, the best teams I've, I've had the pleasure to work with, Marsha included, of course. <laughs> that, that's good, because I know half the problem with congressmen today is they have to raise funds. And I mean, I know that uh, when you walk into the congressional offices, some there's like off-site offices where you're required to be there a few hours each week to make phone calls for campaign donations. Yeah. yeah, it's tough, especially because like, you know, especially with COVID and everything, people are having just a hard time kind of getting into the spirit of things. So, um, you know, it's not stopping us, but we have found that, you know, people are just a bit tired of being inside. I would like to hear what Marsha and you, Nicole, have to think about these Republican accusations of voter fraud and uh, what you can do to stop put our elections back into shape if necessary. Like I know there's been a lot of uh, Republican legislatures pub, uh, starting bills to uh, quote unquote secure our elections. What are your thoughts, I, Marcia? Well, I have my own thoughts, Marcia, if you want to go first. <laughs> yes. We'd like to hear both from Marcia and you, Nicole. Oh, Marcia, your mind. mic is muted. Yeah. Okay. So um, basically, <laughs> when they came on doing all those audits and the audits and the audits, it seemed to only field more results for Joe Biden. So um, I'm not sure how many times Trump likes to lose, um, but apparently he likes to lose over and over again because um, he keeps on doing these audits and they're fielding more results. But everything that's showing the voting fraud is showing on the Republican side. There was a guy who admitted that he voted for his deceased wife um just to kind of say ah look any if i can do it anybody can do it and it just they're they are coming up with the reason why he why trump lost because trump is so narcissistic that um that he didn't believe that any for any reason he would lose and he did so um I mean, I think our voting system's fine. There's a lot of checks and balances that are already been made in place uh, to be able to secure voting fraud. Uh, just to being sure that, you know, voter fraud isn't a thing. So, um, Have you looked into some of the, uh, because one of the major campaign, uh, one of the major suppliers of money for this whole uh, Trump voting campaign is, was a member of the former John Birch Society. And he, if you look into uh, some of the stuff, it's amazing that there's about two or three billionaires that are sh shedding enough doubt and switching the certification of elections from county officials to state legislatures and governments. And what they're trying to do, I think, is, uh, you know, if they don't like the results of an election, they will just won't certify it or they'll move it to the state legislature. There's a lot of what's happening in Texas if they don't like what's going on. I mean, I don't know if you've had any have any thoughts on it. Uh, if that's all, Marcia, can we hear from Nicole on the same question, if you don't mind, please? Sure, go ahead. I mean, if anything, I would say that voter suppression is a much larger issue than voter fraud. Um, you know, and this is something that we really hit on, you know, especially like in our current campaign emails and stuff is that, you know, they're purging voter registrations. They're making it harder to vote. They are closing polling places <sighs> on the day of an election. Um, you know, if anything, I don't, I don't think that voter fraud is an issue that is, you know, it, even if, even if let's say there are, you know, a handful of people who are double voting or something, I would say that the, uh, at this point, thousands of people who are being kept from voting is a way more severe issue that we need to focus on. Um, you know, we see a lot of uh, GOP Congress people who, you know, vote against voter protections and they vote against making it easier to register to vote. They, you know, they vote in favor of allowing gerrymandering to continue. And, um, you know, you find that people's, the power of somebody's vote is diminished by decisions like that. Um, you know, I think that we should make it, you know, even e like, I, obviously right now it's very easy to register to vote, but right now they can in some states get rid of your registration if you haven't voted in a couple elections. 
Um, you know, and it, it, in other states, they're implementing these voter ID laws when it does cost money to get an ID. I just recently paid, I think, is it $30 for my real ID? You know, I had to stand in line at the DMV for four hours and all this. And some people don't have, you know, the luxury of four spare hours. You know, they're like Marsha, they're working full time and they have children and they can't go pay this money and wait in line to go and get the special ID that they need to vote. Um, so if anything, I really think that we need to be focusing on making it accessible and easy and understandable to vote. Um, you know, allowing same day registration, allowing universal mail in voting. Um, you know, those issues are very important to me because I especially see I'm in my early 20s. I see a lot of people my age who just don't vote because they don't have the time and they don't want to put in the effort because sometimes you do have to jump through a lot of hoops. Um, so I, you know, in my perfect world, it would be, you know, as easy as making yourself breakfast to go and vote. <laughs> Interesting. Sharon, Sharon's got a question. Who? Sharon, go ahead, please. I'm oh. sorry. Um, yeah, I was just wondering uh, what Ms. Williams um, has in mind as far as criminal justice reform. I don't think we talked about that yet. No, we haven't. You're muted again, Marsha. We need a complete overhaul of our criminal justice reform, just for criminal justice in general. Um, there is a lot of factors that we need to consider before we kind of dive in. There, it's like a, a, a onion. Um, but I'll give you a little bit of a story. Um, I was 19 years old, and my boyfriend and I were driving home from the movies, and he was speeding, and he ended up getting pulled over by the police. A policeman and we did everything that we were supposed to do he got his ticket and he's left but the officer did not like he entered his vehicle shut the door but exited when we were pulling out and he walked he didn't say that he was cut he didn't approach us he didn't turn on his light didn't say indicate that he was walking back to the car we thought he it, the you know when we were pulled over we thought we were done the officer at some point when he pulled out his gun when he was approaching our vehicle and my boyfriend at the time ended up backing into him and hitting him and of course he realized what happened stopped the car and next thing you know we have a gun pointed in our face and we pushed and pushed and pushed because they were trying to push us under the rug we pushed and pushed and pushed but we finally were able to get this officer or um, fired from the department but it took us like three years to do it if we were black or brown people that guy would have shot us and killed us and that's really scary to to, to think of that um on the other hand um i with me having a pre-law degree I had to sit uh, for a class. I had to sit in a lot of court cases for felony and misdemeanor cases. There has mm -hmm. been times where there were individuals who should not have been there at all. And they're wasting somebody's time. And they're wasting the taxpayers' money and prosecuting a case that shouldn't be prosecuted. There was one case where there was a man who was intellectually disabled and was in a home with other intellectually disabled individuals and ended up getting in a slapping fight with somebody else. There was a punches they were just going like this mm -hmm. at each other um apparently the neighbor called the police and arrested one of the men and he, this his charges should have been immediately dropped because he was not mentally competent to stand tra trial but they put him back and forth for a misdemeanor for battery for months this man months um i've seen um <sighs> Uh, we had, uh, in, in one case here in Grundy County, there was a man who was, um, who killed a baby. He, baby was crying. He threw the baby on the floor several times and he ended up getting probation for eight years. And so there's a lot of criminal justice issues that we need to start just slowly picking, I say slowly picking away. Let's start picking them one by one and start take, 
care of these issues. Another thing is for me is drug court. If somebody is addicted to drugs, prison is not the place for them. They need mental health services. They need to go into rehab. Um, prison is not a place for to help individuals with mental health issues. It's going to make it worse. Um, I am more for um, you know rehabilitation for individuals who are formerly incarcerated. I actually with my industry to um, work with several individuals who are who have been formerly incarcerated for a variety of crimes who have turned their life around and live really awesome lives. Um, yeah, so we have to um, for the criminal justice reform, it needs a major overhaul. Mm-hmm. Did you say you have a law degree or? Yes, I have yeah, a okay. law degree from Purdue University. Okay, uh, it's a what, degree, what law degree did you say? I, it's called legal studies, but it was really pre-law. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, uh, actually, yeah, uh, it's, it's interesting. I'm taking some legal studies courses. Um, I'm, I'm not in your district. Uh, I'm, wait, I'm in Lake County, as a matter of fact. Okay. And uh, Lake County does have, um, apparently, it's got a strong uh, drug court system and the uh, and more more than just drugs, I, I don't I don't know the entire uh, scope of it. So, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's to me, it's obvious that there's a lot of things that need to be changed. I think what's less obvious is is how to go about changing them. And uh, one thing that I think is particularly horrific is the amount of time it takes to get anything processed in the court system, whether it's just to say to find like, for instance, that man who was mentally challenged, you know, he has to be declared so by some sort of expert, right? You know, and why does that have to take months for, you know, to happen? Um, so I don't know, but uh, yeah, so that's my, I guess that's my question is what, what, what can we do to fix things or how, how do things get fixed, you know? Marsha, yeah. don't you think the whole drug war is simply immoral and should be stopped? It's completely it's a complete waste of people's time and money and resources. Yeah, it well, it's immoral yeah. too. I mean, you are you have people that are uh, drinking alcohol and you are people that are you have people that are smoking cigarettes, both of which damage themselves. And um uh but um uh, the claim that's made is that uh, people who are uh, smoking marijuana or taking cocaine or uh, or um, uh, heroin, uh, uh, and these are um, these are adults, people who should be able to decide for themselves what they. <laughs> and and uh, right now we have a, a ton of people who are saying, "Well, I should have the right to take ivermectin," you know, <laughs> if I want to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. some, of the, some of the same people that uh, that are pro drug war um, still um, it's 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 a thing if there's disclosure and um, you know if people know that these things can be addictive uh, and they choose to take them and they don't operate heavy machinery or a car while they're taking them uh, what what is the what society the society have a right to per- persecute these people and put them in jail now as you suggest they could um, be given uh, offers of um, uh, treatment or rehabilitation I think uh, treatment is uh, if you are addicted and you want to get off of this stuff uh, treatment um, hopefully should be very low cost if not free because maybe society does have an interest in people not being addicted to substances but uh, if they um, have of their own free will chosen to do this. I mean, people jump out of airplanes in it with a parachute and it's an incredibly dangerous thing. It gives them a thrill, I guess. But we could, we could simply legislate that anything that gives you a thrill is not allowed. Um, then, then we would not allow any sex. We would not allow chocolate ice cream. We would not allow you to, you know, you shouldn't eat hamburgers. I mean, you should only eat tofu. I mean, you know, yeah. it, at, at a ridiculous level, society, you know, could, could, legislate all of those things, right? So um, from a moral standpoint, the war on drugs is completely uh, immoral. I mean, it is not a matter of uh, even that it's stupid and and uh, wastes money. Um, 
it, you know, you have, um, you know, women like that lady um, who was um, um, treated so foully by the police department with a no knock warrant and they made her stand naked for <laughs> an hour or two while they, I guess they, um, she wasn't that attractive, so I don't know what they were getting out of it, but they, they made her stand naked in her apartment after they knocked down her door because supposedly, oh, someone said, a snitch said that someone in the apartment next door and they got the wrong address, you know, said that she was involved with drugs somehow. I mean, isn't it so totally immoral that things like that are allowed to happen? That you that should, legalize, should be stopped immediately. You want to legalize cocaine and heroin? I think, I think they should be legalized. Uh, yes, yes, I do. I would legalize them what too. What drug are you on? What do you think, Charlie? You'd want to persecute people that um, the same as uh, so. You've in other words, people, have who, people who smoke right. cigarettes should be rounded up and put have, in jail. Yeah, and they're taking significant actions to stop that. There, there are warning um, um, uh, warnings on the cigarettes. And everyone knows that they're dangerous. I mean, you're arguing that because it's reckless driving, you should allow cocaine sale? The two have nothing to do with each other. No, and you gave course, example. Of course, I never said There's anything no about allowing reckless driving. I said that if, if somebody, if somebody smokes cream. marijuana and they don't drive a car, you they should be allowed to do that. I specifically cream, said that they shouldn't operate heavy machinery, Charlie. You equated ice cream with cocaine. In a sense, well, you know, they are similar because well, you're, getting, cocaine, you're getting pleasure from eating ice cream and you're getting pleasure from taking the cocaine. And it could be argued that eating ice cream because it has a high sugar rush. You're saying there's no doctors behavior. have declared <laughs> that high glycemic in high glycemic intake can be damaging to your health and you should reduce your sugar intake to almost nothing. You've heard of that one, haven't you, Charlie? Yeah. You, you, okay. In other words, ice cream could be dangerous to you. So society maybe should not allow ice cream. You know, you should shut down all the Baskin Robbins shops and all the jewels that are selling this terrible compound of uh, sucrose that's in ice cream. And and what about chocolate? Oh my God, that, that makes people feel better after they uh, eat it. So if you feel better after taking cocaine, that's not allowed. It's not allowed to eat chocolate ice cream either, right? By your argument, huh? What do you think about it's that, Marsha? No what, 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 what's allow... I know what Marsha thinks before we hear you anymore? No, here's your solution. Oh, we allow the sale another, of drugs. And another then rabbit we hole. Set up rehab services. Uh, hey, well, wait a minute. What, let's see what Marsha thinks. Wait, well, <laughs> <laughs> so wait a minute. Why don't we kind of like stop the sale so we don't have to have rehab services? So I so take I take it you're pro drug war. I never knew that about you, Charlie. You're pro <laughs> wasting money. My tax dollars are being wasted so that you can put people in jail for things that they did as vo voluntary actions on their part that don't hurt anyone else. You want to put them in jail. Yes, cocaine dealers should go to jail. If if it was a legal product, why would they go I've to jail? I've got no problem with that. If it was legalized, why would they go to jail? Why should they go to jail? If well, it's, according if to it's, you, they it's consent. It's people doing it of their own consent. It should be part of the You want to put people in jail for jumping out of an airplane? That's dangerous to them. Small business enterprise give work to people, right? Certainly what, seems what to be working to do with it. Again, you, you're always right? going off. Of, Marsha, what do you think? Is it immoral to have the drug war? Marsha, you're, you're muted. muted. Okay. You're muted, Marsha. I believe an individual who is addicted should be able to receive um, free care so they can be able to get, you know, things that, you know, to be able to get that treatment that they need. That's a, the part of the, the drug war that has failed our country is you know is a bunch of people being addicted and no one helping them well what if what if it's so what if they feel like it's okay to be addicted as long as they're suppose they're independently wealthy and they have a chauffeur so they'll never have to be operating a car and uh, they just want to be like a hermit like me and stay in their house most of the time with their cats well, the, the person and, who will do other things during the day 
that's not somebody driving them around. I mean, this, this person needs to be able to bathe themselves and feed, eat, eat food and sleep. Well, you can be on and cocaine yeah. and bathe yourself. What are you talking about here? If somebody's on uh, addicted to meth, like my niece was, they would not go to sleep for several days, like several days. And she got to the point that she just, she was just so high that she stopped bathing herself or she had sores oh, on her man. body mm-hmm. because of the fact that she went weeks without bathing. That's like really far in addiction where you think a person can't take care of themselves without uh, someone to uh, even try to assist that person was got to be really, really difficult. So, I mean, my part about the drug war is that it's, it's unnecessary because it's not helping people. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, she maybe didn't want to be helped. You know, did you ever think of that? Doug, no. do you think they, China should have, Doug, do you think China should have allowed the sale of opium by the British? Uh, well, there's a certain amount of coercion the there. Chinese where the British, better, right? The British, the British were forcing the opium on the Chinese. What so are you talking about? That was that was what the whole thing was about. The British were forcing; they were demanding that they should be, um, and and that was a that was a problem with. Uh, countries uh, that was a, t- a sovereign there was a sovereign issue there um, but uh, opium actually um, isn't that dangerous and again it's just a thing of where some people yes if they were addicted and they wanted to get off it I believe they should be allowed to have that um, that choice and it have not be out of the um, out of their uh, range of uh, being able to afford it financially and and it's, you know I, I could be persuaded that my tax dollars, should go to a certain percentage of that, provided the rich paid their fair share, which I would equate to be at least a rate of 40 or 50% of, of income tax. So um, some of these issues are, are related, but um, the idea that you should uh, throw someone in jail or that demand, demand with the force of the state, the fascist state um, that Okay, if they're uh, if they are addicted to a, a drug, and they absolutely do not want to be uh, non-addicted, they don't want to even attempt to um, um, to help themselves in any way. Um, I think that is their choice. I think from a moral standpoint, um, you shouldn't um, um, you know remove them from their environs and and say that you are going to demand that they quote detox and you are gonna use the force of the police state to force them to do that. Just like, I don't really think that people should be forced not to smoke cigarettes. I believe they shouldn't blow their smoke in anyone else's um, um, uh, uh, environs. Uh, I, I believe they should be required not to smoke in a restaurant uh, if the restaurant is non-smoking or the bar is non-smoking, I guess in some cases um, uh, there aren't uh, smoking sections. You know, um, let's go on. You, but you think, but you get rid of, to say you that you get rid of the pure food and drug act. Other rabbit hole. You know, five, right? Uh, what What does that have to do with it? What well, do you, what do you, if I want to buy it, I can buy it. Well, yes, you and should be able to model is let the let the consumer beware, right? Um, it depends if a product is um, uh, touted, you know, see the uh, opium or um, or heroin or anything like that. It or wouldn't be touted oil. as being it wouldn't be the Food and Drug Administration would have Does warning labels on these talk? things. That's what would happen. I don't know yet what's going to happen. a red now. herring there. I mean, all right, on, Sharon. <laughs> All right, Sharon, go ahead. Um, yeah, um, I was just going to say, in 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 the broadest sense, I agree with uh, what what Doug is saying is that people should be allowed to do what they want as long as they're not hurting somebody else, and that means they can hurt themselves. Um, but we do have, uh, but you there are still provisions if somebody is a, really a danger to themselves um there are there are protections for them as well but as far as people just uh you know doing doing 
engaging in dangerous sports or, you know, doing drugs. Um, I, I agree that this is something that How we shouldn't, be, spe we shouldn't be spending yourself? our tax dollars on. What activity do you do in life that is all by yourself? There's no such activity. Oh, for God's sakes, if you're in your house and you smoke a joint, there is and where, no it wears off. Activity. It doesn't hurt anybody all else, right. Charlie. Oh, that's ridiculous. Uh, never all, right. See you later, like that. All, right, all right, all right, all right. We're losing a number I'd, of people I'd be here. Hurt, already. I'd be hurting my. I'd be hurting somebody else if I if I smoked. I've never smoked a joint, but I defend to the right, like Voltaire said, that other people be allowed to if they want to. All right, it's, Doug, it's an Doug. issue of the Enlightenment, my friend. Well, uh, you know, sorry, we, uh, Marcia, um, who else has a question? Janice, anything you want to bring up? Uh, all right. I seeing is how we're starting to get uh, run out of questions. Let's go straight into rebuttals. Who's got a rebuttal tonight? And uh, Marcia will get the last word, of course. Rebuttals are where you give a brief five-minute comment on something like that. Um, Martin, Nicole, if you, uh, I don't have a rebuttal tonight. Um, Janice, you got anything you'd like to say or Charlie? Unless there's any more questions. I will just add, I did put it in the, um, in the chat, but me and Marcia do have to hop off in about 15 minutes here. Okay, okay well, I'll, I'll do a very short rebuttal. It's not really a rebuttal, but um, uh, I think right. um, I, I, I've thought of running for public office myself. It's crossed my mind. Uh, um, I applaud uh, Marsha uh, if she uh, wants to do this. It's a very um, onerous thing. I'm a very lazy person myself, ultimately. I've come to recognize that in my old age that I think that I'd be able to take on, you know, large tasks and then, you know, I might start something and <laughs> just absolutely give up especially when the odds are so stacked against the person when when the you know you you know how they say uh, try try again right but on the other hand there are many scientists that said well you know maybe you're better off just stopping because you don't waste a lot of time keeping on trying when it's not you know when it's a task that's completely out of your possibility of of of, of doing but uh there are people that um that um have maybe had, you know, there, there just this was this guy, which is so funny. Just now, there was this guy um, who spent $150, I guess, and all he had was a Facebook page, and he ran for state senate, and he upset the most powerful, supposedly the, the speaker of the state senate, or whatever they call that, uh, majority leader, I guess, uh, in New Jersey. He upset him, which is crazy. So maybe he'll do the same thing. Maybe he'll get lucky and that will be, you know, uh, he was just a truck driver, believe it or not. That's what he, you know, it, it was so funny that that happened. And, um, um, and uh, so uh, if you want to do this, I'm embark on you. I, 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 I okay. give you my blessing and I say, that's, that's terrific. I think you need to hone up on the issues a little better. Um, so that you still I, just early in the campaign, Doug. Huh? Still just early in the campaign. Yes, indeed. Um, but there's a lot you have to be wonkier. <laughs> That's why I was getting got wonky on you in that one question, you know. But um, uh, you, you have to know these things. You have a good heart, it seems. Um, you have a good um, uh, feel, feeling for you're on the right side of, of things for the most part. And um, I, if I lived in your district and, um, um, you know, if you were <laughs> depending on the other candidates, I very well might vote for you. I, I don't think there's a chance right. of that happening because I'm an Indiana resident, but so I don't have a dog in this fight. Okay. But uh, um, um, I uh, thought of running myself several times, but um, okay. I didn't do it ultimately because um, there's so much work involved. So you better be aware of that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Charlie, you got a rebuttal. You always do. You get the last First word. To call. All, uh, I mean, Marsha. I thank uh, the candidate for uh, putting together. It sounds like a good campaign. Um, the uh, and the campaign manager as well. 
bringing you those outlines. Uh, I'm vaguely familiar with the district. Uh, I uh, had a great deal of dealings with the uh, employees of the Rock Island Arsenal who lived in Illinois. So I'm somewhat familiar over the years. They were my companions and work in Congress. I'll be eclectic as usual here. Uh, first of all, regarding the highway, adding another lane, um, congestion has never been solved by adding another lane anywhere in the United States. Uh, you have to look at some alternative approaches. Uh, Tim doesn't understand. There's a whole association called rural transportation. Uh, I'm familiar with rural transportation, which is provided to the residents of Indian reservations who somehow have been able to figure out how to do it. You bring the deposit to people. I was in West Virginia without a vehicle. And I took advantage of rural transportation uh, while I was there. Uh, and, um, so yes, it can be done. You have to look at the demographics uh, in that sense. So transportation is an issue that does concern the people. Of course, uh, there are exploration. Some people seem to think that the electric car is going to solve everything. And, but you have to look from an ecological point of view of the energy that goes into making a car and, and so forth. Anyhow, that's on transportation. Williams is a good name to run on. About the only name politically that's better than Williams is, I think Johnson is a good name. I mean, yeah, but yeah, people do vote by name. Um, getting back to transportation, uh, sorry about it, Tim, but there's about 100,000 rail carloads of nuclear waste, which we don't know what to do with. And they're going to travel through the district. 100,000 estimated rail carloads. So this is a matter that's going to come up before Congress. And I think some of those three nuclear reactors are contributing some of the gallons of this nuke juice. So I think some remedy is sought uh, in that regard. Also, the fact I believe there was an incident, it didn't result in any harm to anyone, but I believe there was a... Uh, a crude oil tank car train that derailed within the boundaries of the district. I could stand corrected. I have to go back. But the shipment of, of materials through the district is of some concern. Actually, those are areas where they start picking up speed. Um, and so it is something to think about. Uh, regarding hydrogen, uh, there are advances, or even testing right now. One of the automotive manufacturers has got a prototype of a hydrogen powered locomotive. But I believe one of the problems with hydrogen is, is that it's in fact a greenhouse gas and one of the nastier greenhouse gases. You know. Really? Um, but I'd have to look that up again. Uh, Charlie, uh, water vapor is a greenhouse gas, and hydrogen, when it burns, creates water. <laughs> when it quote burns, as I said, so it, it, it results in a greenhouse gas. Water vapor is a greenhouse. Gas. There are about half dozen greenhouse gases that are of serious concern, uh, and I believe hydrogen is in that category. Um, yeah. Last of all, the Green New Deal, um, if you look at the last five pages of it, talks about in instituting uh, 
eco-socialism, the transformation of the economy. And I'd like in the cabinet period, so I think if the candidate would like to indicate what her sentiments are regarding the transition of the U. They call it a solidarity economy. Uh, is she an advocate of the transformation of our U.S. economy? Anyhow, thanks for coming out. Good okay. luck with the campaign. And stop back and give us an update. Thank unless, you. Unless there are any other rebuttals, Marcia, you get the last word, and then we'll end a little early tonight. So go ahead, Marcia. You got the last word. Just thank us or anything you want to say. Well, thank you again for having me on today. Um, I appreciate you taking your time out of your Saturday to speak with me. Uh, you're a great group to deal with. I'm glad to meet all of you. Um, if you want any more information, you want to sign up for my newsletter or volunteer or anything like, anything like that, you can go to my website at marshawilliamsforcongress.com. And yes, Williams is a good name to, to run on. I didn't pick it. That was my father's last name. <laughs> well, it's better yeah. than Binkley. It rhymes with Hinkley, huh? <laughs> <laughs> they just they released that guy, you know, the guy who shot, shot at Reagan. And yeah. Missed him, but he hit Brady. <laughs> <laughs> That's how we got the Brady bill, at least. <laughs> yeah. So one good thing came of it, huh? <laughs> yeah. Of course, right. the Brady Bill was allowed to expire. I mean, there's a whole lot of wonky things going on. And and okay. thank you also for being interested in, in social justice, uh, too. Yeah. Thank you, Marshall. All right. At oh, this you. point, I'm going to end the recording of our meeting. So feel free to stick around for a while if you'd like. Otherwise, uh, feel free to go. Um, with this, I'm going to call the College of Complexes officially closed. <laughs>